I'm the Reverend Dr. Alexia Salvatierra. I am the Assistant Professor of Integral Mission and Global Transformation at Fuller Theological Seminary, and I'm responding to Dr. Richard Flory's presentation. I appreciate the clarity, breadth, and interesting quality of Dr. Flory's presentation. But of course, you can't say everything that you need to say about Los Angeles at a global crossroads in one keynote, maybe in many keynotes. There is a particular part of the Los Angeles story that I would like to explore that is particularly relevant for migration and for missiology. Dr. Flory talked about a paradox in the Los Angeles region of pluralism and tolerance on the one hand and racial animosity and discrimination on the other. While that paradox, I agree that that paradox is generally true, over the last 40 years, there has been a remarkable shift. Dr. Manuel Pastor, who is a distinguished professor of sociology and American studies and ethnicity at the University of Southern California, as well as the director of the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity and the Center for Immigrant Integration, just published a book called State of Resistance, what California's dizzying descent and remarkable resurgence means for the future of America. In that book, he chronicles a 40-year journey from economic collapse and domination by conservative public policies to economic resurgence and domination by progressive public policies. This included a major shift in attitudes towards immigrants and policies impacting immigrants. In 1994, California passed Proposition 187, which would have required immigration screening to access any public education or health services. While the legislation only directly affected undocumented immigrants, supporters' rhetoric focused on Asian and Hispanic immigrants in general as a burden on California. Governor Pete Wilson's campaign was fueled by that anti-immigrant re rhetoric, but even the Democratic senatorial candidate as well as the Republican senatorial candidate endorsed Proposition 187. It was declared unconstitutional in 1999, but it's still been copied or adapted in a number of different states across the nation. So let's fast forward to 2020, where California has some of the most immigrant-friendly policies in the country. We offer driver's licenses, regardless of immigration status. Immigrant students pay in-state college tuition and we prohibit the collaboration of local and state law enforcement with federal immigration enforcement, except in certain felony cases. What happened? <laughs> well, Dr. Pastor says, even though there were some external factors, including a wise governor, Jerry Brown, that this could not have happened without well-organized social movements, primarily led by immigrants and people of color. And the picture you see there is a photo of the 500,000 people marching for immigration reform in 2006 in central Los Angeles. Dr. Pastor identifies four characteristics of these movements that made them successful. The first one is the ability to work together effectively across sectors and ethnic communities to build an ecosystem for change. Secondly, the movement was pragmatic and realistic it intentionally included conservative areas and an integrated voter engagement. So not just going to voters when there was an election, but involving people in civic participation year round. Although it was a statewide movement, the, some of the most creative leaders in the movement were in Los Angeles. Um, you see here a picture of state Senator Maria Elena Dorazo. She was the first Latina to run a major labor union local. And then she was the head of the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor. And in both those positions, she was deeply committed to coalition building and to immigrant rights. The other picture is the Reverend Dr. James M. Lawson Jr. 
Dr. King called Dr. Lawson his theologian of nonviolence because he was the primary architect of the theory and practice of nonviolence in the broader civil rights movement. But he was a major leader in these movements in LA. In 2007, I was the executive director of Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice, an interfaith network of faith leaders and congregations committed to support low-wage workers in their struggles for economic justice. I was invited to a meeting with a delegation of the major representatives of the major philanthropic foundations in the country, all of them in the Northeast. They had come to California to see what they were calling the Los Angeles miracle. They wanted to know how we had turned the region around. So why Los Angeles? I want to go back to, um, why did this happen in Los Angeles? Is there something about Los Angeles that made this possible? I wanna go back to some of what Dr. Flory was talking about. He talked about Los Angeles as a place to start over. So many of the leaders of these movements were new leaders We were reinventing ourselves and each other and the region in the process. In comparison, in the Northeast of the country, social change organizations often have rivalries that go back a hundred years. There were no ancient turf wars in Los Angeles to keep us apart. Secondly, Dr. Flory talked about how this region is known for cultural creativity and innovation. And I think that as a movement, we were very comfortable with being polycultural because of this. And we were very comfortable with creating new models. He talks about pluralism. And we were also very comfortable with being polycentric, having a wide variety of leaders that work together. Lastly, he talks about the climate and the physical environment. And clearly we were able to hold dramatic, colorful public actions all year round, which is something that you need this kind of climate in order to do. Now, what does this have to do with missiology? It's obvious what it has to do with migration, but what does all this have to do with missiology? Well, if we understand the missio dei, the mission of God, as an integral mission, a mission to the whole person, in the whole family, in the whole community, in the whole society, that includes shalom as well as conversion, then if we're looking at a movement for social transformation where poor immigrants become agents of change, we have to say, maybe God is in this and we need to study it and we need to understand it. But even more than that, in this particular movement, there was active participation of the church, including the evangelical and Pentecostal church in the context of a broader interfaith movement. And the little picture here is a book that was written about Clue um, by actually by another USC professor at the time. Although I do wanna say that Clue was not the only player. We had two strong congregational based organizing networks, one from the Industrial Areas Foundation and one from PICO. We had very creative smaller groups like Korean Churches United for Community Development and La Red de Pastores Tesoro de California, which when it started in 2006, had 1,200 Hispanic evangelical and Pentecostal congregations in the Los Angeles region involved in immigration reform. So I wanna give you two examples to end of the depth and the breadth of this movement. This was not a faith-based movement. This was a faith-rooted movement. So we um, were the lead agency at Clue for the New Sanctuary Movement nationally. In Los Angeles, we had a number of immigrant families living in churches who would have faced deportation if they had left. The picture that you see in the middle is Pastor Cesar Arroyo. He's a Peruvian immigrant and a Lutheran pastor And even though his congregation was primarily immigrant and at least a third undocumented, they welcomed a family into their church. But then we heard that the Minutemen, and you can see a picture of them, they're the anti-immigrant forces um, in California at the time, that the Minutemen were going to target the church the next Sunday. Well, we had had experience in the sanctuary movement of that before. When they targeted a church, it meant that they stood outside during the Sunday service and they screamed obscenities. And anybody who looked like an immigrant who came in the church or left the church, they threatened. So Pastor Oroyo, with a lot of sadness, told his congregation that they did not have to come to church. 
the next Sunday. So the whole sanctuary movement came. And then we found out that there wasn't room for us because his whole congregation had shown up and they had a plan. After the service, they processed singing hymns and praise songs around the church. And you can see the Lutheran bishop there. He was there and he was up near the front of it. And they stopped in front of the Minutemen and they prayed for the Minutemen. Well, the Minutemen didn't know what to do. They just went silent. And so then we went back around and Pastor Roy, everybody went in and Pastor Royal turned to the Minutemen and he said, God bless America. Whereupon the Minutemen said, God bless America. <laughs> there was a journalist standing next to me from La Opinion, which is the largest Spanish newspaper in Los Angeles. And he turned to me and he said, I've been covering the immigration beat for 20 years and I have never seen anything like, anything like this. You are going to make me a Christian. Now I want to go to another story. Um, we, one of the programs that Clue had is that we built the Loving the Stranger Coalition in Orange County, which engaged four primarily white evangelical megachurches and two ethnic specific evangelical megal churches and a number of other churches. It was a coalition to work on immigration reform. So after we had done that, um, we realized that the whole movement was facing a challenge, which Dr. Pastor talks about, which was the tension between African-American and Hispanic immigrant leadership and communities in Los Angeles. So we decided to build the Black Brown Pastors Coalition and we decided to kick it off with an event on the anniversary of the LA riots. The two anchor churches in this event were West Angeles Church of God in Christ with 18,000 members. Bishop Blake, who was the lead pastor, senior pastor, was also the prelate nationally of the Church of God in Christ. Iglesia de Restauración, which came out of the denomination Elim, which is one of the largest Pentecostal denominations in Central America, was pastored by Rene Molina, who fulfilled the function of a bishop for all the Elim churches for Southern California. So we started at Iglesia de Restauración with a press conference that we called For All Our Families. And we had a banner up with John 17, 21, that the world will know that Jesus has come because of the unity of his followers. And we talked about immigration and we talked about criminal justice and we talked about education. Then we had a worship service inside Iglesia de Restauración where Bishop Blake preached and a combined praise team, you know, <laughs> filled the house. Uh, then we processed down Crencha Boulevard, which is the main artery. And we stopped and we had an open revival service where we invited the whole community to come with us. By the time we got to West Angeles Church of God in Christ, we filled the cathedral. Um, Rene Molina preached there and the same praise team raised the roof. As we were leaving, I was translating between African-American and Hispanic immigrant participants. And what they were saying to each other is that they would never enter the grocery store. They would never enter the laundromat in the same way because they would never know who were brothers and sisters that had been with them that night. The stories that I've been telling you are the stories of the church's engagement in the mission of God for Shalom in the Los Angeles story. Fuller is a global seminary. And yet we are well aware that we are located, as Dr. Flory talks about, in a place and a culture. And we know that that's a gift. So while we continue to be a global seminary, we also try to take advantage of that gift. So currently the Diplomado in La Respuesta de la Iglesia, La Crisis Migratoria, is a professional certificate program for Hispanic pastors and leaders in the church's response to the immigration crisis. In the Diplomado, from the beginning, we worked in partnership with Matthew 25, Mateo 25, which is a network of primarily evangelical churches in the Los Angeles region immigrant and non-immigrant churches working together. And that partnership is a great source of mutual enrichment for Fuller and for Matthew 25, Mateo 25. So as we go into this, on into these missiology lectures, we wanted to kick off 
with this vision of how we hold together the global and the local in a way that takes full advantage of the gifts of place and culture. Thank you.